major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. San Diego's ban on homeless encampments is moving forward, and now the city is giving people a place to go. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. A parking lot has been turned into what the city is calling a safe sleeping place. And as KPBS reporter John Carroll shows us, people are expected to start moving there tomorrow. We have transformed this portion of this facility into a place where unsheltered residents can get off of our streets and uh, sidewalks out of our parks and canyons and be safe. The facility Mayor Gloria is talking about is the city's central operations yard, known as 20th and B because of its location. Specifically, it is this parking lot. The lot opens as the city's ban on encampments is about to come into effect. I've said it once and I'll repeat it today. If there's a place for you to go, your answer cannot be no. People will not be allowed to bring their own tents here. Rather, the city is providing these tents. At full capacity, this lot can handle 136 of these tents, and the city says each of the tents can handle up to two people. But two people in one of these tents would be pretty tight quarters. But Council Member Stephen Whitburn, who authored the homeless encampment ban, says this is not about comfort. It's first about getting people off streets and sidewalks and other places like canyons and getting them the services they need to find permanent housing. Here they will have uh, security, they'll have bathrooms, uh, they'll have connections to services and ultimately housing. It's a win for the surrounding area because people will be able to use the sidewalks and parks for their intended purpose. But it could also land the city in court. A case out of Boise, Idaho years ago went against that city, saying it could not arrest people if there were no shelter beds available. So the question is, do tents and a parking lot count as shelter beds? The Boise case focused entirely on individuals who were sleeping outdoors. Uh, it did not focus on structures like tents. And this ordinance is a prohibition on tent structures. But lawyers involved in law surrounding homelessness say that issue is not settled. Still, for now, this tent-filled parking lot is ready to go. It will open tomorrow morning. Another one, Lot O in Balboa Park, will open this fall, and it will accommodate 400 tents, eventually moving hundreds of people off the streets in a city that has thousands there now. John Carroll, KPBS News. San Diego is a few days into stronger tenant protections for renters in the city. The new ordinance took effect last weekend, 60 days after it was passed by the San Diego City Council. It bans most evictions as long as a tenant is following the terms of their lease. Landlords must also keep tenants in the loop on the new protections, according to City Council President Sean Elo Rivera. As part of that, landlords are required to notify uh, their tenants about what their rights are. Um, so that folks can protect themselves from being unlawfully evicted. The Tenant Protection Ordinance also calls for more data collection on evictions. Ila Rivera says that information will help the city better tailor any future reforms. How are internet speeds at your home? Friday is the deadline to take a state survey that will determine how money will be spent to enable fast internet access to Californians. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen looked at why it matters. There is no fast internet in many rural areas and tribal lands, but there are also communities in the city, like Logan Heights, where it exists, but it's unaffordable. One in five homes there don't have it. I think that's probably one of our um, highest needs in our community. That's Katherine Johnson, branch manager of the Logan Heights Library. She says patrons come in to use the internet for basic needs, like job applications, homework, and paperwork for assistance programs and medical appointments. They can also borrow Wi-Fi hotspots to bring home. 
but there's a wait list. They are so popular. We have 99 hotspots uh, at our location, and uh, we probably get, I would say, maybe six, seven calls a day asking if we have them available. More than 100,000 people in San Diego County lack fast, reliable internet. That's according to a county analysis of census data. Most zip codes only have one or two fast internet providers. Not a lot of competition means higher prices. People can apply for financial help from the federal government for internet service, but most eligible households in San Diego County haven't. The survey which is meant to help officials target barriers that underserved residents face to accessing the internet, is online. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. Bus service is returning to normal in parts of the South Bay and East County. MTS and its passengers were caught in a month-long contract dispute between TransDev and the local Teamsters Union. Those TransDev workers handle some minibus routes and appointment-based access service. MTS warns there might still be some delays as staff levels return to full strength. The city crews today finished installing new traffic calming measures in Pacific Beach after the project was briefly delayed. Diamond Street now has diverters at two intersections, flexible posts and signage to direct drivers to turn right while allowing the pedestrians, the cyclists and emergency vehicles to pass through. City Council Member Joe LaCava says the changes will improve safety and make Pacific Beach much more walkable and bikeable. Extreme weather is snarling air travel ahead of the 4th of July holiday, leaving thousands of passengers stranded at airports. Laura Aguirre has more as the country's transportation secretary weighs in on the situation. Now you can't control the weather. We've had very tough weather the last few days. Severe storms across much of the U.S. this week have played a role in thousands of flight delays and cancellations since the weekend. But there's more to it. In the process of waiting for the lightning to clear up, our pilot timed out. The always ticking clock on air crew hours and the FAA's ongoing shortage of air traffic controllers can stretch any weather delays and passenger misery out for days. If you like my clothes, this is day three. They didn't have enough flight attendants for our flight and it got pushed back. We got on the plane and then the pilots timed out. The pilot said that there's a mechanical failure and they won't be able to fly the plane. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg praising the airlines for operational improvements on Wednesday, but adds there's a long way to go. What's different this year compared to a year ago is that there is more cushion. We're seeing more of the staffing that there needs to be. Storms and staffing headaches aside, Secretary Buttigieg notes that U.S. air travelers have more rights this year when flying, and they should use them. Anybody planning a trip, and a lot of Americans are, can go to flightrights.gov and get more information about uh, what you are owed in the event that you get stuck. That may still not be enough for some frustrated flyers. We're going to drive to Minneapolis because they can't get us out until Friday at the earliest. I'm Laura Aguirre for KPBS News. The ongoing push and pull over what the public can know about data picked up by police surveillance tools is playing out in local courts. Any day now, a state appeals court will decide whether to hear a case about a, f a fight to review the Chula Vista Police Department's drone footage. KPBS's Amitha Sharma has more. Each day, Chula Vista police officers deploy drones like this one to respond to 911 calls, investigate crimes, search for missing people, among other tasks. The agency's police chief, Roxana Kennedy, elaborates in a department video on how vital she believes the drone's high-powered cameras are to law enforcement. Drones provide invaluable information to officers, sharing with them a visual into what is actually occurring. It makes all the difference to officers, dispatchers, and supervisors making split-second decisions. In a nod to privacy rights, Chula Vista police say on their website that their rules bar using drones for surveillance or general patrol. Art Castaneras is publisher of the Latino newspaper La Prensa San Diego. He wants to corroborate on his own whether that's true. Whether police are hovering over somebody's house, looking into a backyard. He says he is all for Chula Vista police using drones and he trusts officers are not spying on residents. Nonetheless, trust but verify. All we're trying to do is to confirm how these are being used 
that they're following the procedures. Two years ago, Castaneras filed a California Public Records Act request. He asked Chula Vista police to turn over footage from all drone flights for the month of March 2021. The department refused, claiming the footage was investigative and therefore exempt from disclosure. Castaneras sued. In April, a San Diego County Superior Court judge sided with Chula Vista police. The department declined an interview with KPBS citing litigation. Castaneras has asked the 4th District Court of Appeal to hear the case. A decision is pending. Despite the lower court loss, Castaneras argues the law is on his side. There's no difference in the fact that the video is strapped to a drone than if it was a body cam camera worn by a police officer or a surveillance camera that's on top of a light post at a corner. These have all been ruled to be admissible, uh, to be to be disclosable. Brian Hofer runs the Oakland-based Secure Justice, which advocates for reining in surveillance technology. He says the San Diego judge's ruling that Chula Vista police need not turn over the drone footage to Castaneras because it is investigative, if unchallenged, could lead to a dystopian future. Hofer contends the court's decision, in effect, says the video can't be released in case a future crime arises. And that makes us all suspect. Obviously, our country was founded on the exact opposite principle of, of innocent until proven guilty, that you cannot surveil us if there's no reasonable suspicion or probable cause and collect such data. Hofer says the ruling also forces the public to accept Chula Vista police at their word that the drone footage is investigative without independent verification. He argues the impact of that is huge. Then transparency into policing is dead. It's dead on arrival. And all the hard work of, of, of you know, reform efforts is going to die on the vine because you're not going to have the information that you need to suggest policy changes or to hold people accountable. Albert Fox Kahn is executive director of the New York-based Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. He agrees with Hofer, but he also worries about privacy interests if the Chula Vista Police drone video is made public. I do think there is a very real risk that when we allow this drone footage to become even more accessible, that it will become a threat to the public, not an accountability tool. The idea that a police department could fly a drone over my backyard and then anyone who wanted to could get that footage, that to me is a, a, a concerning situation. Meanwhile, Art Castanera says the point of his lawsuit against Chula Vista police extends beyond the city's borders. This is about how police agencies across the country want to use new technology for surveillance, and they don't want to show the public how they're using it. More than 5,000 public safety agencies across the nation use drones, according to DroneResponders.org. About two-thirds are law enforcement departments. Amita Sharma, KPBS News. I'm Jeff Bennett. Tonight on the News Hour, extreme weather across the country as wildfire smoke blankets the Midwest and a heat wave scorches the Deep South. Coming up at 7 right after Evening Edition on KPBS. You may remember hearing about fraud and COVID relief programs for businesses. There's now a number on just how much money was given, $200 billion. The Small Business Administration says that accounts for 17% of all funds it distributed. In all, the administration handled just over a trillion claims. About 4.5 million were fraudulent. Some of the money was paid out through the Paycheck Protection Program, but most was paid through economic injury disaster loans. President Joe Biden is promoting what the White House is referring to as Bidenomics. His remarks today come as several economic indicators seem to point in a positive direction. But as Mike Valeria reports, continued high inflation and job cuts in tech and finance could spell some trouble down the line. President Joe Biden in Chicago Wednesday touting his vision for growing the economy. Bidenomics is about building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. And the strength of the post-pandemic recovery, highlighting the strong jobs market and falling inflation. We created 13.4 million new jobs. More jobs in two years than any president has ever 
made in four. While acknowledging people are still struggling. I'm not here to declare victory on the economy. I'm here to say we have a plan that's turning things around incredibly quickly. Well, we have more work to do. The president's optimistic outlook, however, is not necessarily in line with how Americans feel. There is essentially something in this economy for everyone, and that can inform a lot of arguments that may be diametrically opposed to one another. A May CNN poll revealing 66% of Americans disapprove of the president's handling of the economy as financial indicators continue to send mixed messages. On the one hand, for example, you have a high level of job cuts and layoffs. On the other hand, you still have a close to historically low unemployment rate. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell signaling Wednesday more rate hikes lie ahead. What you see is stronger than expected growth, uh, a tighter than expected labor market, and higher than expected inflation. So that tells us that although policy is restrictive, it's not, it may not be restrictive enough. More aggressive action from the Fed could still lead to a recession. What form it will take remains unclear. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. The Biden administration today announced investments in infrastructure projects across the country, including the South Bay. The $2.2 million will finance 162 community-led projects. $12 million will go toward eliminating a rail crossing in Chula Vista. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says these grants will help create jobs, improve safety, fight climate change, and advance equity. The trend of falling gas prices in San Diego County continues. The average price for a gallon of self-serve regular gas dropped two-tenths of a cent today. The average is now $4.87. It is the seventh decrease in eight days. The national average price dropped for the fifth day in a row to $3.55. Big things are happening at the Stone Brewery in Escondido. Nearly a year after being acquired by Sapporo, the brewery is ready to start releasing locally brewed Sapporo beers to the U.S. market. As KPBS North County reporter Alexander Wynn shows us, it involves making some big changes. Enter through the gargoyle guarding the entrance of Stone Brewing Company in Escondido. The gargoyle is our protector of our beer. You see a smooth operation. And it's one of the things that impressed Sapporo. When the Japanese beer giant was looking for another U.S.-based brewery to brew its beer, it was looking for one that had the capacity to quickly get the product onto the market. Stone Brewing Company met that requirement. When Sapporo was looking um, for a partner, they were looking for someone that could expand and brew Sapporo, but also a brand that they could help further develop. And so they fully embrace what Stone is, and we continue to innovate uh, into the future. And this is where kind of all the magic happens. Sean Monahan is the chief operating officer for Stone and Sapporo Brewing. He says while Stone had the capacity to start brewing Sapporo beer right away, there was still a learning curve to get the recipe just right. We did our first big brew, and I'll tell you, it failed. It uh, various lessons learned. It just didn't scale the way we thought it would. So we actually had to like scrap that initial brew. He says Sapporo's core process of brewing beer was already similar to how Stone was brewing its beer. But the main difference is the yeast. It's always underappreciated by many people is like how important the yeast is. Stone is using the same yeast used in Japan. After nearly 10 months and several tries later, Stone is releasing the first batches of locally brewed Sapporo beer. This is imported Sapporo, and this is Sapporo brewed in Escondido. They look exactly the same, they brew exactly the same, and this is most important, they taste exactly the same. The only difference is that it tastes crispier because it's fresher, being locally brewed. It will be a few more months before locally brewed Sapporo will be available on store shelves. But you can find it at each of Stone's bistros under the experimental lager labels. Stone still needs to upgrade its facility to handle brewing both Sapporo and its own line of beers. We're investing about $20 million in capital to expand the Escondido Brewery. So while, yes, some of the equipment may be coming from overseas, but a lot of the construction and the, the labor is going to be right here in the in San Diego market. And that means more jobs for the local economy. Stone is looking to hire more than 100 positions within the next six months. Alexander Wynn, KPPS News. 
A reminder to homeowners the deadline to pay property taxes is approaching soon. San Diego County residents have until Friday to pay property taxes. Treasurer's tax collector Dan McAllister says any bills unpaid by Saturday will go into default and those bills will receive additional penalties of 1.5% each month. You can pay online at sdttc.com. More prisoners across the country will soon have access to higher education. A program offering undergraduates federal Pell Grants while serving time is set to expand next month. Congress voted to lift a 1994 ban on Pell Grants for prisoners in 2020. It costs about $20,000 to educate a prisoner with a bachelor's degree program at Sacramento State. The interim director of the program there says that that's far cheaper than the $106,000 per year it costs to incarcerate an adult in California. If we can keep them out of prison because of this education, because of the, let's say, twenty or thirty thousand dollars of taxpayer money that we invest in them, we put twenty grand down on one guy, and he stays out of prison for twenty years at a hundred and eleven thousand dollars a year. I would say that return on investment is better than anything I've ever invested in personally. The expanded program will offer $130 million in financial aid to about 30,000 more students per year. A warming trend continues over the coming days into this weekend. Some uh, major heat coming up uh, to the desert. Some more on that just ahead. Meanwhile, continue dry. And we'll let you know if any changes are in store as we head our way into next week. Let's start off with the short term. For tonight, we slip back into the upper 50s around Oceanside toward Chula Vista. Some clouds along the immediate coast, Borrego Springs, down to 68. And much like the last couple of nights, we'll hang out around 50 into Ramona. Bouncing back into the mid 80s as we venture forth into your Thursday afternoon. Borrego Springs 103 and wait till you see where we go down the road from there. Mount Laguna climbing into the 60s and notice a little nudge up down around Chula Vista up to 74. So we're trending and again with those temperatures climbing here in the coming days and even notice on future casts as we go through time clouds hanging along the coast throughout the early morning hours and then it begins to dissipate as we work our way throughout the afternoon but the interior valleys will see increased amounts of sunshine as so even toward the coast where again we're looking at clouds and sunshine but mostly sunny skies by Sunday we're going to respond to the temperatures that is then we'll be climbing up through the mid to the upper 70s come Sunday into Monday check out the interior Interior valleys, though, big changes here ahead with lots of sun Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. We're climbing out of the 80s and bouncing up into the 90s. Overnight lows remaining right around 59 to 60, 61 degrees. And even over the mountainous terrain, with all the sunshine anticipated, look at the jump in the mercury going from Sunday to Monday. We're climbing out of the 70s through the 80s and right up in to the 90s. And speaking of 90s, oh, we're going to blow past that and talk about triple digits, even the 100 teens throughout the desert. So the core of the heat coming up as we work our way into the upcoming weekend, especially again as we head into a Saturday, but again heading into Sunday and still hot as we go into Monday. Overnight low temperatures only falling off into the upper 70s to around 80 at that point. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Justin Povick. There's a new work of art in San Diego to put on your summer bucket list. A painting by notable black American artist Kehinde Wiley is now on view at the Timken Museum. KPBS arts producer and editor Julia Dixon Evans takes us inside. Kehinde Wiley rose to superstar fame after his official portrait of President Obama was unveiled in 2018. But the artist has been rewriting history and representation in art for nearly two decades. Gaidi Finney is executive director of the San Diego Museum of African American Fine Art. It's always been at the forefront of, of the current um, art world. For instance, he's like, we believe, a, the black American, a black rock star artist. This painting, equestrian portrait of Prince Tommaso of Savoy Carignan, is huge. And with an ornate golden frame and vivid background, it's eye-catching even from far away. A black man dressed in modern clothing rides a horse. It mimics a work by 17th century painter Antony Van Dyck. This is a through line in Wiley's art. He takes traditional old paintings and replaces the characters with black models and other people of color, 
reclaiming concepts of heroism and glory. He's thinking about uh, how those particular figures have been excluded from the history of art. He's putting them into the poses of some of those great paintings, and he's making them as vibrant as possible. The Timken intentionally placed the work in a gallery full of Dutch and Flemish paintings from the 17th century side by side and literally outsizing the museum's world famous Rembrandt and another work by Anthony Van Dyke, who's the artist who inspired Wiley's new twist. Cartwright says this room in the museum is basically an art history lesson. This is one of the great places in the country to study 17th century Dutch and Flemish art and introducing Wiley into that conversation I just thinks it, I think it makes it a much more interesting place to be. The Timken is always free to the public, which is also fundamental to the mission of the San Diego African American Museum of Fine Art. It's a museum without a physical space, so they rely on collaborations with other museums, like this one with the Timken. Their aim is to get important black art in front of as many people as possible. Our mission is to bring the best art in the world to San Diego. This is American history. The painting will be on view at the Timken through next May. Julia Dixon Evans, KPBS News. And here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. Nearly 90 million people across the country are under heat alerts while also facing unhealthy air quality. NPR's Morning Edition is discussing the health risks. And KPBS Midday Edition has your weekend preview of all the best arts and culture events happening around town. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabolsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.